This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Corey Johnson, in for Emily Chai. Well, throughout the hour, we're going to bring you some highlights from the Bloomberg Global Business Forum, a gathering of more than 50 heads of state, hundreds of global CEOs addressing economic growth and prosperity. We're going to start with our own Emily Chang interviewing Alibaba's founder and executive chairman, Jack Ma. They talked about everything from President Trump to Alibaba's competition with Amazon, but they started with how Ma sees technology leveling the playing field for small business. I think the world is, may, is shifting from uh, big companies to small companies. And a small company means entrepreneurships. So I'm passionate about entrepreneurships. I'm, talk, I'm passionate about the small business. I think that's the solution for this century. Creative jobs, innovation, creative. Because small business, if you're not creative, if you're not innovation, innovative enough, you don't have chance. So this is my passion about, and I believe this is also the future of this century, business. You heard President Trump speak at the UN. What's your relationship like with President Trump? Well, he's a very uh, unique president, and uh, we had a very good discussion last first time, uh, last time, and talking about China-U.S. trade relationship and things. I think that the China-U.S. relationship is very, very critical in this century, especially the business side. So I think uh, they are making progress on that. Really, because uh, you know Trump's top trade negotiator just called China an unprecedented threat. The president blocked the takeover of a U.S. chip company, Lattice, by a Chinese private equity firm. What do you make of those moves? Well, that happens here and there and now and then when. And I think this guy, this is a, this is a way that uh, if you see that op you know, optimistically or positively, there are conflicts and they should make each other, understand each other better. So I, uh, I think the next two years, there's a lot of uh, conflicts each, all the time. But that, whether it will be a fatal disaster, whether it's going to be things, it's rely on the wisdom of the leaders. What about uh, his tact on North Korea, when he says the U.S. will totally destroy North Korea uh, if they threaten us? Is that the right approach? Um, you know, I have enough headache of myself, my business, because when I hear about that, I say, oh, yeah, you know, this is a, uh, for, for people like us, we want a peace. We don't want people killing. But of course, we care about the, the, the nuclear weapons that's going to destroy massive uh, things. But I think this is, uh, as a business people, I focus on creating jobs and doing good things, and the government have to do their right things. So how about when it comes to your business in China? Um, President Xi Jinping has been taking more steps to put restrictions on the Internet. This is your business. Oh. What, do you, what do you make of that? You really feel that? I, I think they're not necessary. Well, the shutting down of the VPNs is just one example of, of late. Okay, yeah. Well, we probably see a different view on that because this is the way I see business. 18 years, in the past 18 years, this is our 18th year anniversary. For the eight, past 18 years, I've got questions to buy this China internet censorship and this and that all the time. But I am, I am the, uh, the first internet guy in China since 1995. We see the American has been enjoying democracy for 250 years and China just started like in the past 30 years. I would say past 30 years China is learning a lot of things, is making progress. For these things, you know, if there is a controlling here and there, it's like a three, five percent issues. So what we should do is focusing on 90, 95 percent of the positive things. And I think the, the, when the government the, uh, the, 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 what should I say? The governing or regulator of the internet is such a new thing to any government. People like me, I've been talking to thousands of hundreds of government offices every year because I think it's my responsibility to tell them, don't worry about it. You know, this is the way to do it, how to do it. So I never complain and I try my best to 
to educate them. So you think they're ultimately going to be on the right side of history, the Chinese government? Obvious. I am 100% for sure because nobody can stop this technology revolution. Everybody is learning how to govern, how to regulate. Yesterday, you celebrated the three-year anniversary yeah. of Alibaba's IPO. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, Amazon and Alibaba, the market caps, have kind of been flirting with each other. I know that you have generally stayed in your own regional lanes, but as you become increasingly global companies, where do you see competing with Amazon directly? Well, uh, Amazon is an e-commerce company and very successful and we respect a lot. But Alibaba is not an e-commerce company. We are e-commerce enabler. We are e-commerce infrastructure builder. Mm. So as I said, people may like, like it. I say our job is to enable more companies become Amazon. Mm. So uh, when we see Amazon is doing good job, is successful, we're telling everybody, you know, e-commerce works. So we don't, we're not necessarily competing. But investors and uh, the journalists always put lots of competitors because I spent very, very little time studying the, you know, how can we compete with Amazon? Is how we can learn from Amazon that uh, empower more business can be more efficient on internet time. They uh, recently bought Whole Foods. You have been investing in, in groceries for a long time. Yep. I'm curious where you see similarities and differences in your strategies. Yeah, we, uh, we said uh, in China, we, in the past 15 years, we grow so fast on retail. A lot of people say, well, we destroy retail, traditional retail. So the question we started to think about five years ago, destroy retail is not our purpose. Our mission is helping doing business easier. So we cannot helping the, uh, the new retailer destroy the old retailer. So we say, how can we using our technology, our data, our market power to help in the traditional uh, uh, retailer? So it's not by destroying them. We want to enable them. So that's why we, we invest and buy a lot of uh, 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 traditional supermarkets, uh, malls. We want to learn, and then we want to help more. This is the opportunity. Uh, Alibaba is trying for a third time to get approval for the MoneyGram acquisition, U.S. money transfer company. What's plan B if that doesn't happen? Well, I cannot actually, honestly, I, I, uh, I leave this job for the Ali Enter Financial, mm -hmm. Ali Payne to do that. Yeah. And, and today uh, I cannot make comments because I know so little they are yeah. applying for the third times. So I, I cannot make a comments about that. Um, I trust the world is uh, going to be more open-minded and the globalization should not stop it, and uh, protectionism will stop. But today, for this period, it takes time for Chinese company and uh, the, the American government or government company to communicate, and some features will be helpful. You've said that Alibaba will create a million jobs in the U.S. by 2021. Tell us more. How many jobs so far? What kind of jobs? Well, we think in five years, we signed, uh, we started to agree last year. So in five years, we create one million jobs. We want to enable more small business in America, helping them to sell products to China, helping them sell products to Asia, which we are pretty good at. That. And we think in China, we created 33 million jobs. So each business, if they are online, they can create at least three jobs. So we hope that we can help one million small business in, in, in America. They can list on Alibaba site and we help them to sell to Asia and to China. We had a successful Detroit uh, conferences. We start testing and I think we'll probably gear up next year. Last question. You've said Alibaba has a three, five and ten year plan. What are those plans now? Well, we are working on that and we have uh, not only three, five, ten, three years is uh, the, the plan and five years is the direction uh, is the the, the strategy direction and 10 years the vision 20 years yeah. so we always have to think about the future because we as the since nine, 1999 when I started the business I said doing business on the internet e-commerce is like a one 10,000 meters marathon right. running so you should have uh, run as fast as a rabbit but you should have as, as patient as a turtle you have to be very, very patient. You have to think big, think the future, and then you can, you can be happy. Otherwise, you have so many problems. Until 2101, 102 years is your, your plan, right? Yeah. 2101. Why 2101? Yeah, Where did you get one that or two number? Years. <laughs> well, we were born in 1999. Last the century, we had a one year. And this century, we won 100 years, and plus one year. 102 years will, will cross three centuries. So every number you're giving to the team should be accurate.
Yeah. So the more accurate you are, the more serious you are, and your employees, your colleagues, your friends will take it seriously. And that was Alibaba founder Jack Ma and Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Well, story we've been watching after months of wrangling, Toshiba has agreed to sell its flash memory business for $18 billion. The buyer, a group of, uh, led by uh, private equity firm Bain Capital, including backing from Japanese and overseas companies, including Dell, Apple, SK Hynix, and Hoya, they're going to provide financial support. Toshiba expects the deal to close by March 31st. Coming up, much more from the Bloomberg Global Business Forum. Tim Cook will talk to us about Apple's responsibilities as a global civic leader. This is Bloomberg. Well, from immigration to climate change, Apple's taken an aggressive stance on global issues under the leadership of CEO Tim Cook, a very different approach than Apple under Steve Jobs. Cook sat down with Bloomberg Business Week uh, editor Megan Murphy of Bloomberg's Global Business Forum to discuss Apple's role on the world stage. As a CEO, I think one of your primary responsibilities is to decide what the values of your company is and, and lead accordingly. The other thing I think is that uh, the uh, uh, thing that uh, President Kennedy used to say uh, that originated from the Bible, actually, is to whom much is given, much is expected. And uh, Apple has had uh, success, some success. And, and so we feel a, a responsibility to give back, to help in some of society's greatest problems. And, and, and so for us, we try to look deeply at what issues are, is government working on, what issues are key in society, and we think about the skills we have. There's some issues that we have no skills on. We're not going to be able to help there realistically. But there are some that we can really either amplify government efforts, uh, working hand in hand, or we can pretty much do ourselves. And, uh, and uh, you know, Apple has always been at the core about changing the world. And arguably, you can't change the world if you're ignoring the world. And so uh, that's kind of the way that we look at it. As a, as a CEO, uh, not only today, but in the past as well, I, I think that uh, silence is the ultimate consent. If you see something going on that's not right, the most powerful form of consent is to say nothing. And I, I think that's n not acceptable to your company, to the team that works so hard for your company, uh, for your customers, or for your country, uh, or for each country that you happen to be uh, operating in. And, and so that, that's kind of the way I see it. And I have to say, I am more optimistic today than I have ever been. And I mean that sincerely. And uh, that's despite uh, sometimes not feeling like that. But overall, I think we're, we have an incredible opportunity. Because never before have I seen uh, the ability uh, all across the world to work together on some of these common issues. Talk about education. We all talk about the lack of innovation, whether we're pre preparing our workers, our children, for the jobs of tomorrow and not the jobs of yesterday. Apple has been very vested in education, particularly on coding as well. Is that moving as rapidly as you think it needs to, to address what Jack Ma has called the technological revolution, the third technology revolution that we face. I, I've been uh, really heartened by the public sector here and uh, their uh, willingness to engage and be very aggressive. Uh, we, we started uh, many years ago crafting a language that would be as easy to learn as Apple products are to use. Uh, we, we then designed a curriculum. We found an incredible number of K-12 institutions wanting and pulling the curriculum. 
Uh, we then took that to community colleges. We rolled that out in May. There, uh, we're already talking to 33 different community college systems in the states. And, and, and these are huge systems with hundreds of thousands of people in them. And, and so I'm seeing an uh, incredible desire uh, to bring coding to the masses. This is, in my view, one of the keys to the middle class. You know, where manufacturing was a key for the middle class uh, years ago, coding is, the, is a key for the middle class for tomorrow and, and today, to be frank. There's mass shortages in the world, and it's not just in tech. It's that coding has become incredible, uh, fundamental to all of our businesses. You know, whether you're running a retailer or uh, an automotive manufacturer or, or whatever you may be doing, there, or, or the guy on the street corner, actually. Uh, and, and so I'm seeing, I have not seen teachers not willing or wanting to do this. I've seen a lack of, of uh, development dollars being spent in, in schools, and so we're actually training teachers right now. And uh, through every classroom, I can honestly say that through every classroom we've been in, we've found uh, willing teachers, administrators, and the kids are more engaged than ever before. You know, kids want to learn about the digital economy. They're growing up digital. And, and it's not good for them to grow up digital and then go to school and be in an analog world. It just doesn't work. It turns them off. And uh, so, yeah, I'm seeing incredible uh, government support there. Uh, we are running Apple on 100% renewable energy in the U.S and many other countries around the world. I've seen uh, incredible government support there, particularly in China. Uh, we now run our Chinese operations on 100% renewable energy. Uh, that is going well, and we're spending a lot of time on human rights. You know, we believe that everybody should be treated with dignity and respect, and, and that's if you're born with a disability. Uh, we want our products to work with everyone, whether you can see or hear or not. Um, and of, of course, we're, we're trying to do our part in enlarging the definition of human rights for everyone. And uh, a lot of that, uh, the immigration discussion earlier, really plays into that as well. And that was Apple CEO Tim Cook with Bloomberg Business Week's Megan Murphy. All right, coming up, ride-hailing giant Didi Chuxing constantly expanding in China. We'll hear how next. This is Bloomberg. I want you to check out the after hours trading right now of Blue Apron. The stock is gaining uh, after news that uh, Albertsons, uh, the privately held Albertsons, which operates the Albertsons and Safeway chains, announced the acquisition of Blue Apron rival Plated. The deal is seen by some investors as maybe a sign that Blue Apron could be a takeout target also. Well, earlier this year, ride hailing giant Didi Chuxing raised more than $5.5 billion from investors, scoring the largest round of funding ever for a tech company. The goal to bankroll an expansion beyond China and into driverless technology. Didi's president, Jean Liu, gave a presentation at the Bloomberg Global Business Forum, where she highlighted Didi's massive growth in China and the company's plans for the future. Check it out. 25 million rides take place on Didi every day which is twice as many as the other markets add up worldwide. And we see very encouraging results coming out of these efforts. There are 17 million drivers that earn income from Didi's platform last year. 20 cities are working with us to completely redesign their traffic signal and vehicle lanes. And in the test zone, as you can see, we've already seen congestion time reduced by 20 to 40 percent after only three months of work. And also, the deep learning technology allow us to put more people into fewer cars. So four million passengers use our carpool products every day and that alone takes away millions of tons of carbon emission every year off the road. And technology also saves lives. 
Globally, the mortality, the road mortality rate is 1.6 deaths per 100 million miles, 1.6. And by adopting the new dr safe drive technology on DD's platform, that number got lowered to 0.6 per 100 million miles. And lastly, it's the whole ride share network co is completely redefining, redefining the car industry. The next generation of cars will become greener. As a matter of fact, we are already running the largest electric vehicle fleet worldwide, and the number is growing very, very strong. But this is just the beginning, and we know how massive, how difficult this problem we are all facing together. That's why we remind ourselves every day we need to work harder, and we need to collaborate with as many people as possible. That's why we have invested in seven leading players around the globe in rideshare industry, from Southeast Asia to Middle East, from Europe to Latin America to United States. And we believe in sharing. We think sharing the best practices, sharing the best product, knowledge, will make our industry grow faster, and that can benefit more people around the globe. That was D.D. Chusheng President Gene Liu speaking at the Bloomberg Global Business Forum. Well, coming up, another powerhouse panel from Bloomberg's Global Business Forum, Bill Gates, as well as Masayoshi Son on how innovation, technology, and the future of business are all that. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. Hundreds of volunteers have been digging in the ruins of a collapsed Mexico City school where at least 25 students and teachers were killed in Tuesday's magnitude 7.1 earthquake. Others are digging through the rubble of collapsed structures searching for survivors. 52 people have been rescued thus far. With 225 confirmed dead, it's Mexico's deadliest quake since 1985. U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions says he believes the Trump administration will beat all legal challenges to its proposed border wall with Mexico. Sessions says anyone has a right to sue, but his responsibility is to defend U.S. borders. He expects construction to commence when Congress provides funding. At the United Nations General Assembly, Iran's President Hassan Rouhani today fired back at the U.S. and defended his country's position in the nuclear deal it struck with six world powers. We were not deceived, nor did we cheat or deceive anyone. We have ourselves determined the extent of our nuclear program. We never sought to achieve deterrence through nuclear weapons. Rouhani says it's a waste of time to meet with President Trump, who blasted the agreement at the U.N. on Tuesday. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell will push ahead with a GOP health care bill on the Senate floor next week. The Graham-Cassidy bill repeals core elements of Obamacare and gives block grants to individual states. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. here in New York, 7.30 Thursday morning in Sydney. My colleague Paul Allen has a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Well, we have ASX futures very modestly higher right now, up three points as a U.S. markets ground ever higher following that uh, Federal Reserve meeting. Uh, the U.S. dollar took a hawkish cue from uh, these uh, word of a December rate rise and possibly four more in 2018. Uh, the Aussie dollar pulled back a little, but it had touched 81 cents uh, before the Fed meeting. So the Aussie just uh, trend line seems to be just pushing ever higher. Nikkei futures also up modestly this morning, and it's the Bank of Japan and next off the rank for the central banks will have a decision in the coming hours likely to remain on hold but we'll be watching for any news on possible reduction of bond purchases and elsewhere new zealand will report second quarter gdp that's expected to hold steady at two and a half percent i'm paul allen in sydney more from bloomberg technology next
This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Corey Johnson in for Emily Chang. Now back to our coverage of the Global Business Forum and our inaugural event the world's most influential world leaders, international CEOs, and top investors all gathering at the Plaza Hotel in Manhattan, not least of which Carlyle Group co-founder David Rubenstein. He sat down with Dan Goat Industries CEO uh, Aliko Dan Gote, as well as Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates, Pepsi's CEO Indra Noyi, and uh, SoftBank CEO Masayoshi Son. The topic, what else? Innovation. Last 30 years, the innovation of the microprocessors, using the microprocessor as a base, to create internet. That is the, has changed the life of almost everybody on the earth. But going forward, it's, I think it's accelerating even, even more on that. Now, Mas, earlier in your career, you were a technology in, uh, innovator. And at one point, I think in year 2000, you lost $70 billion of net worth. What did it feel like to lose $70 billion <laughs> of net worth in one year? <laughs> Well, uh, it, it was a crash. Everybody crashed. <laughs> but uh, somehow, you know, I, I, at the bottom of the crash, I actually revived my spirits of the fighting, you know? So actually, it was good. Yes. By the way, <laughs> by the way, by the way, maybe Bill does not know. For three days, I became richer than Bill in that day. <laughs> <laughs> well, but then after 12 months later, I, I became almost broke. 99% 99, 99 drop in our share price. 99% in one year. So well, let me ask you one other question about your career for a moment. Uh, at one point, you made an investment of $20 million in a little company that wasn't heard of by many people called, I think it was Alibaba. Yes. Um, it became worth about $90 billion and now worth about $130 billion. So uh, how did you decide that Alibaba was a good investment? And do you have any more like that you could recommend to us? <laughs> well, uh, the Jack Ma, not because of the business model, not because of the technology, it's because of his charisma in leadership. And uh, China had enormous opportunity uh, of the upside. Uh, I said, this is the guy that can be the leader for this innovation. Okay. Uh, Indra, you've tried to take a company that was known for selling, selling sugar water in some, the view of some people and make it a more nutritionally um, safe and better company. Was that hard to beat the bureaucracy back at Pepsi when many people didn't want to do the things you wanted to do? I think it was hard within the company. It was hard outside the company. I remember uh, even investors telling me that, you know, don't forget we're Americans. We like our soda and chips. Don't try to change us. And when I asked them if they changed their habits, he said, oh yeah, we've changed our habits, but we don't want you to change what you're doing. So we had to fight <coughs> battles across multiple fronts. Change does not happen quickly in our industries because we have to change consumer taste, we have to change the product portfolio, we have to change the business system. So it's still happening, it's a work in process. Now if you go to somebody's house for dinner and they say, would you like Coke, what do you say? Or do you, does that ever happen, or you leave the dinner, or you? Yeah, sure. I say it was nice knowing you, right. <laughs> and I leave. <laughs> so, Bill, you I'd leave. like to ask you. I do leave. Yeah, <laughs> without a doubt. <laughs> Actually, my secretary sends them a list ahead of time in case there's a mistake. <laughs> Bill, I'd like to ask you a question. I have asked you before, but uh, people are interested in this answer. Uh, all of us who have used personal computers are used to turning them on, and we have to have three fingers to do so. Control, Alt, Delete. And it's a little awkward sometimes to do that. Uh, you are the person who came up with the idea of doing it that way. Why did you do that? <laughs> The IBM, the IBM PC hardware keyboard uh, only had one way that it could uh, get a guaranteed interrupt generated. So, uh, you know, clearly the people involved, they should have put another key on uh, in order to make that work. A lot of machines nowadays do have that as a, you know, more obvious uh, function. Uh, but no regrets about doing it that way? It worked out okay? Well. I'm not sure you can go back and change small things in your life without putting the other things at risk. Uh, sure, if I can make one small edit, I would, uh, I'd make that a single key operation. Now, now uh, by the way, you dropped out of college. Um, 
do you think had you gotten your college degree, your life would have been better off? <laughs> well, at the time, it, it felt like uh, there was a huge sense of urgency that obviously the microprocessor was revolutionary and writing software for it. A lot of existing companies, including IBM, with infinite resources would go and do that. So if we were to have any hope, you know, the sooner we did it, the quicker we did it, the more hardcore we were about it. Uh, and so I didn't want to waste a day. And in my 20s, you know, I worked weekends. I, I didn't believe in vacation. Uh, we had to move at high speed because eventually IBM did come in and do OS2 and compete with us. And, uh, you know, lots of companies came along later. Of the companies that were formed in that period, we were really the sole survivor. Oracle did another type of software. They're about our vintage uh, as a software company. But those are the only two companies that really uh, survived out of that era. Us, because we were a broad product company, we did platforms, we were very international. So I wouldn't, it would have been hard to hold me back. Once I saw that opportunity, uh, Harvard, which I loved, was a very relaxed thing where you would sort of sit in classes and stay up all night and talk to people. It didn't have that if I, same intensity. So I, I really, once I saw the opportunity, uh, I was gonna leave. And your, your parents, what did they say? Uh, they were saying, hey, we were paying your tuition. Uh, <laughs> what does this mean? And I said, well, I'm on leave. Uh, which is true, I could have gone back. Uh, Harvard's very generous about that. I mean, eventually the course catalog sort of changes on you and you're a little too old for it. But uh, they, they, they weren't sure if it would succeed or not, so they, they thought maybe I'd head back. But you know, because I was single and mo just maniacal uh, in those days, it was a perfect thing for me. Another highlight of the panel is when David Rubenstein asked David Bill Gates about fighting diseases in Africa and the argument for not wiping out mosquitoes entirely. Check it out. Malaria is only killed by uh, a type of mosquito called an anopheleen, which is like one out of a thousand mosquitoes. And, you know, the idea, the main thing is that it's precedent setting. If you think, okay, humans can go and get this species, you know, what's your criteria for anything that might be a nuisance and yet you might make a mistake, it might be key to an ecosystem. Uh, if you got rid of all mosquitoes, there actually are some bats that feed on those mosquitoes and you'd have to look at those ecosystem effects. The anophelines are such a small percentage of mosquitoes and, and there's no, but no other species that's dependent on that, that this new uh, genetic approach called gene drive, uh, that it's still in the labs, it's not totally proven, but it has a good chance uh, being able to knock down anopheline populations by about 99% uh, over a five-year period. That probably, for the toughest part of Africa that includes Nigeria, the, you know, sort of the center, uh, where malaria is really a, a huge problem, we probably need that tool. And so, you know, how are we gonna get consensus on that is tricky uh, because, you know, some people worry I, I suppose there must be somebody who worries about mosquitoes. Most people worry about the precedent of how such decisions are made. So Indra, um, it's often thought that you, we hear about great technology leaders or great innovators, they often are men. Is that because it's of a sexist thing where men don't tend to let women uh, you know, uh, get the opportunity or is it some other reason and do you think it's gonna change anytime soon? I am not an expert on women in technology, but I will say something interesting. I was at an MIT event on Sunday, and the president of MIT was telling me that 50% of the engineering graduates from MIT are women. But if you go to most companies, 50% of the engineering staff are not women. And if you read some of the stories in the press about what happens in the Silicon Valley area, 50% of the people are getting the funding or in the valley are not women. So obviously there's something that's causing that leakage between MIT, which is a premier institution, and in practice. Okay. So I think if we want to utilize all these resources that we are spending money on and graduating, we have to do something okay. different. Final question, Masa. Uh, is artificial intelligence a good thing for humans or not a good thing? And are your robots gonna take over humanity? 
I think that the misuse of artificial intelligence could be horrible, but there are thousands of good reasons to utilize artificial intelligence for good for humanity. It solved the, the unsolvable diseases. It solved the you know unsolvable uh, you know disaster and many other things. So uh, I think it's it's really good. And that was Carlisle Group co-founder David Rubenstein with uh, Dangote Industries, Eco Dangote, Microsoft founder Bill Gates, and PepsiCo's Indira Nobi, and of course SoftBank's Masayoshi Son at the Bloomberg Global Business Forum. Coming up, Democratic lawmakers setting their sights on Facebook. They want answers about Russia's social media meddling in the 2016 election. We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. A group of Democrats sent a letter to the Federal Election Commission asking for more disclosure on political advertising from Internet companies, not least of which... Facebook, the social networking giant, recently disclosed it was paid by Russians for election-related ads. Senator Mark Warner, who sits in the Senate Intelligence Committee, said a hearing will likely be held in October. Joining us right now for more details, Bloomberg Technology reporter Sarah Fryer. Uh, glad to see you. Uh, this, story, this story has many components. I want to break it down to a couple things. Let's start maybe with what we heard from Facebook today about their new uh, ways to combat these kinds of ads, most importantly the sort of anti-Semitic ads that uh, uh, ProPublica was able to uncover. So that we're talking about two different things here. So all of this relates back to the fact that Facebook has this self-service advertising platform that anyone, you or I, or a business could go on and decide on our own how to target who we're going to target, um, what demographics, what interests. And people on Facebook had been listing their jobs and uh, their education with very racist, anti-Semitic things. And so it, it used and to allow, it would allow for someone to say, I live in Oakland, California, and right. I need a dentist or something. And dentists could advertise for those people. Well, I mean, but it no, let other it, people it would, abuse it would, this, yeah. Yes, it would, it would allow that person to say, like, I'm in, I you know, work in Oakland as a hairdresser. But it would also allow people to say, I work in Oakland as a Jew hater, right? And so you could target anyone who has that descriptor, right. um, it was just kind of an automatically sorted system, kind of like on Google where you advertise based on whatever keywords people use to look things up. So that was one failure of the week with the with the ad system. And, and, and what they announced today was it was a new way to go after them, not least of which I thought was ironic, an army of people, an actual like <laughs> human beings reviewing yes. the ads. Yes, because Facebook has done this all sort of, in order to scale a business to the size of Facebook, you need to have a lot of a lot of uh, ease of use, right? And, and this is something that is possible for anyone to use, including you know potential Russian government associates who might want to mess with an election. Which is the second part which of the story. Which is the second right? part which of the story. So, which is that when it comes to television advertising, because television is regulated, because the spectrum is limited, there are going to be so, mm -hmm. so many TV stations, at least in the pre-cable era, that the government was able to put restrictions by the FCC and say, we need to know about political ads, we need to know what the spending is, it has to follow certain rules. Right, right. And so it's very standard in political advertising. If you're doing a TV ad, you need to report it to the FEC, say who paid for it, say where it ran, you don't need to do that with these digital properties. So basically the point of both of these stories today is, is a lot of this stuff is kind of run behind the scenes, helping prop up this gigantic business, and it hasn't really been scrutinized either by Facebook or by the, the government. And so the, well, the had, step from Facebook today yeah. was Sheryl Sandberg coming out and saying, we're not going to allow any more targeting by these racist terms. We've, we've scrubbed our database a little bit, but we're also going to make it possible for people to report right. abuses of our platform. Well, because they want to find out about it before ProPublica does. I mean, they had yes. no problem yes. cashing the checks, right? They, we don't know how much money they made off of these ads, but they seemed to, this didn't seem to be a problem to them, at least worthy of bubbling up to the top until somebody else found it. But for cashing, if the people didn't pay, I'm sure they would have had problems real fast and found out about it. <laughs> um, it also strikes me finally that the Congress getting involved could be a problem because their disclosure to uh, investigators uh, like, like the FBI have not been uh, uh, has been greater than their disclosure to Congress itself. Well, 
this is this is just the start of a process. Congress wants to think about getting Facebook in to do a hearing and learn more about this. And this is just them sending a letter to the FEC saying, you got to take a look at this. And hopefully they come up with some some steps to a solution. We shall see. Sarah Fryer, Bloomberg Technology News. Thank you very much. All right, coming up, we're going to head back to Bloomberg and inaugural Global Business Forum for our exclusive interview with Tim Cook, Apple CEO. This is Bloomberg. Let us return to the Bloomberg Global Business Forum. And Tim Cook, the Apple CEO, has been outspoken about his views about immigration and told Bloomberg's Megan Murphy why he believed it to be the, he believes it to be the biggest issue of our time. We're pushing extremely hard on this. This is, uh, I think, it's the biggest issue of our time currently among all these big issues because this goes to the values of being American. This is, are we human? Uh, uh, are we acting with, uh, in a uh, track of morality, right? These people, if, if, if you haven't met them, uh, the, at, at Apple, we have many that came to the U.S. when they were two years old. They didn't exactly make a decision to come. Uh, they came here, they only know our country. This is their home. They love America deeply. When you talk to them, I wish everyone in America loved America this much. They have jobs, they pay taxes, they're pillars of their communities. Uh, they're incredible people. And so, to me, it would be like someone coming to Mike and saying, oh, Mike, I just found out you aren't really a citizen here, you need to leave. This is unacceptable. This is not who we are as a country. And so, I, I, I am personally shocked that there's even a discussion of this. this. This is one of those things where it is so clear, and it's not a political thing, or at least I don't see it like that at all. This is about basic human dignity and respect. It's just, it is that simple and straightforward. On the broader sur subject of immigration, uh, if I were a country leader right now, my goal would be to monopolize the world's talent. I'd want every, every smart person coming to my country yep. because smart people create jobs and, and jobs is the ultimate, um, ultimate things that create a great environment in a country, a land of opportunity, a land where everybody can do well if you work hard. Uh, these are the things that drive people. It gives people a sense of purpose. And uh, so I, I'd, I'd have a, very aggressive plan, not, not just to let a few people in. I would be recruiting. Right. And, and, and so I, I think I, was in, I went to Ellis Island on, on Sunday yeah. because I wanted to feel myself what it was like to come to the country. And if you've ever sat in the Great Hall and one of the benches that were there in the early 1900s, you can feel the people in that room. And you can kind of feel both the anxiety and the hope. And I, I think y y that, that is where we all started from. Maybe not Ellis Island, maybe it was Virginia like my family. But we all started somewhere. We are all descendants of immigrants in the United States. And that was Apple CEO Tim Cook with Mike Bloomberg and Megan Murphy at Bloomberg's Good Global Business Forum. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. On Thursday, we'll sit down with Marwan Fawaz, CEO of Nest. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.